Welcome, everybody, to the October edition of the Power Show, Mississippi Power Show User Group. Uh, tonight, we have author and tech evangelist Tim Warner presenting on using regular expressions with Windows PowerShell. And take it away, Tim. All right, Ron, thanks a lot. Uh, can everybody still hear me? Hear me, Ron, your audio dropped off suddenly at the end, and I'm wondering if that was me or you or something else. All good? Okay, that's all I yep, need to I can hear. hear. Okay, good. Well, yes, um, welcome everybody, and thank you, Ron and Mike, for inviting me to present tonight. It occurs, looking at this slide that hopefully you're all seeing, that I kind of look like a homicidal maniac in that picture. So note to self, get a new headshot tomorrow. But anyway, why don't we take a look at what we'll cover in the next hour. I'm going to go until 9.30. I'm definitely respectful of your time. I'm not sure what time zone you guys are from, Brian, Jason, and Richard. And I also don't know if we have other people connecting from around the world. If so, welcome to you, too. What I, I was thinking about as an instructor in preparing this for you is, first of all, making sure you walk away tonight having a good understanding of why you should care about regex. And I can't remember if it was Jason who mentioned you know, running into the regex problem before too long with your PowerShell work. But even more importantly than that, I want you to walk away having more confidence than you do now in applying regular expressions in Windows PowerShell. Now, there's a little bit of a, what's the correct term here? Not smoke and mirrors, but you're going to learn that regex, if you don't already know, is pretty standard. And the fact that we're in PowerShell is cool and it's all well and good, but the same skills, the same syntax, generally speaking, is going to apply in practically any scripting language you see. But of course, we're focusing on the implementation in PowerShell. I want to also let you know to relax. I know being in a, an attendee position as well as a presenter position, there's that thought, how can I get everything that the, um, is being taught to me on the first try? Well, don't worry about that. This slide deck, any code that I show you, script files and so on, I'm going to put them all together in a zip file and put them on my website. So if you're going to make a note of anything, you might want to make a note of this URL, timwarnertech.com forward slash get regex.zip. Now, don't try to get the file now because I haven't actually created it. I'm going to put it together after, the, after we finish tonight. So it should be available a few minutes after we end. And I'll show you the URL at the end of the presentation as well. OK, so all that having been said, level setting. You never know, as a presenter, what the skill level is of your attendees. So I would place this using Microsoft standard. They have numeric 100 through 400 standards. I would say that this presentation would be at 150. Split the difference, where level 100 means that you're pretty new to the material. You really don't have a lot of confidence with it. And level 200 is you're just starting to have the gears click together and you want to know more. I hope that that meets your expectations coming in. So regex, just in general, very briefly, and we're going to do most of this as a demo. So please don't worry about getting the old PowerPoint hypnotism or death by PowerPoint, I think, is the normal term. What problem are we trying to solve anyway with this talk of regular expressions in Windows PowerShell? Well, number one, a very common use case is validation. We want to validate that, say, phone numbers are properly formatted, you know, the three, depending upon where you are in the world, country code, area code, exchange, and so forth. Validating input in terms of correct email formats, passwords, domain names, IP addresses. The list goes on and on, right? Social security numbers, if, for instance, you're confronted with needing to identify personally identifiable information in a database or a number of database tables, how in the heck can you do that efficiently? The other problem is just locating that data, searching for data, not just whole words or, you know, the old MS-DOS command line stuff with asterisk and question mark. I'm sure you all know about that but words within a sentence, unwanted characters, how to filter those out. Once you've found exactly the patterns that you're looking for in your source text, how can you extract them out and then do operations on that extraction? How can you make replacements to the source data, so-called data cleaning or formatting operations? 
Well, these are all problems that can be solved rather handily, I would say, with regular expressions. And being PowerShell scripters, of course, and I've said this too often already, we're combining the two. Again, very briefly, just to give you a little bit of trivia and to wet your proverbial whistle, regular expressions has been around for a long, long time. The formal definition that I would use is that regular expressions is a syntax that allows us to describe text or string patterns. I mean, you think about things like words like this, realize and realize. Depending on where you are in the world, you may use a Z or an S. Well, you want to write your regular expressions to pick up both of those cases. What are the repercussions if you're not matching close enough? You could be leaving behind data. A word is one thing, but once you start to get into network stuff like IP addresses, social security numbers, credit card numbers, leaving data behind could have big implications. Web addresses, URL formats, how can you pick up matches on weird characters like backslashes and forward slashes and, and so on and so forth. As it happens, this regular expression syntax started around 1950s. This American mathematician named Stephen Kleene, he weirdly pronounced his last name Kleene, but anyway, he started developing this algebra, this symbol syntax called regular sets that was meant to, to more accurately kind of meta-describe language. This proceeded through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and the Unix Linux world. You know, the GREP, which actually stands for Global Regular Expression P, I forgot what P, print. That's what it is. And more closely, getting into the 90s and now, Perl, that scripting environment, is pretty much the baseline standard, and .NET Framework picks up from the Perl-compatible regex syntax, and here we are today talking about .NET Framework and Windows PowerShell. As you probably know, our goals when, we want it, when we're using regex are we want to find our precise matches. Like I said, you might have uh, some pretty big consequences of not getting all the matches, whatever it is in your data set that you need to grab, and you also want to reject the data that you don't need. You want a good signal-to-noise ratio. Now, it's beyond our scope, but another thing to keep in mind going forward, once you start to get more comfortable with using and implementing regular expressions, is that you can actually work on performance tuning them. So it's one thing to develop regex expressions that give you what you need. It's another to use the correct meta characters that are more CPU friendly. So I just put that in your hat as a point to think about. I first came across regular expressions in the late 90s doing writing with Microsoft Word. You might know that the advanced find function allows you to search for non printing characters like spaces. And now understand, the syntax here in Microsoft Office does not use regular expressions. It has its own wacky syntax. So what you're seeing here is a caret and a dollar sign. Those mean totally different things in regular expressions. But it just turned me on to the power of rather than just doing a control F and looking for a static string, you can search for literally any pattern if you know the proper syntax. And any good text editor worth its salt, like Sublime Text or Notepad++, has the capability to turn on pattern matching with regular expressions. If you do a Control F in Sublime, for instance, and hit that first little button, the dot and star, which you'll learn in a few minutes is like the way to do just an absolute total match. <laughs> you know, it's like as wide open as you can go, dot star. And then you can construct your regex pattern and find it right in your application. Wrapping up the theory, why PowerShell? Well, number one, we're IT pros, not programmers. So we're probably not dealing with .NET framework directly. And I've already let the cat out of the bag. I normally ask attendees if they know what engine, what regex engine PowerShell uses. And of course, it comes directly from the .NET framework. All right, so with that, let's cut over to demo and see what we've got going on. And again, any questions that you have, I have one eyeball on the conversation window, so pop them in there. If you're more comfortable asking questions with your voice, 
just interrupt me and I'll stop talking. Otherwise, my jaws just keep on moving <laughs> and ask me your questions and we'll go on from there. So we're looking at an elevated instance of the PowerShell ISE. And I just throw in little tips and tricks as we go along, not intending to insult anybody's intelligence at all, but I want this to be as impactful as possible. So if we right-click the PowerShell icon, we can open the ISC. As an administrator, I've set my location to a folder on my D drive called sample data. And actually, I made a commitment to myself that I was going to avoid using um, shortcuts or aliases and try to be as proper as possible with my PowerShell code. So instead of using the DIR alias, for instance, I'm using get child item. And in my sample data set, just taking a look down the names list, we have some CSV files, some text files, some Office files, and so on and so forth. So we'll be working with some of that as we move along. There's other tools besides just working directly in the PowerShell console that I'll show you over the next half hour or so that you might find helpful. Many are free, some are a charge. Your mileage may vary on how you want to do that. OK, so how do we get comfortable or develop a comfortability with regular expressions right from within PowerShell here? Well, you're probably familiar with the old wildcards, like I said, where star dot star is any file of any extension. Well, the get child item uh, commandlet allows us to use a parameter called filter that does accept that non-regular expression syntax, where the star is going to represent zero or more instances of anything. And the question mark just represents a single place wildcard. So this filter expression should get us any Excel file, regardless of whether it's the old school XLS or if it's the SLSX extension. That's not regular expression as handy as it is. One place where we're going to run into regular expressions with PowerShell is when you're doing uh, using where object and you're doing filter. So for instance, there happen to be a number of files that start with region. We could, again, I'm just going the long way here, understand that. I'm doing get child item dot, which means we're looking in the current working directory. And in my where object clause, we'll take a look at dollar sign underscore dot. Each item as it comes in from get child item, we'll grab its name property and check this out. We've got our comparison operators, and regular expressions is all about the match operator. So rule number one, you can use regex expressions when you're performing matches. And that can come about in most commonly probably in a where clause, as you see here. You'll notice that ISC has given us some different options. In my experience, I just use uh, match or C match. By default, um, match is not case sensitive, it's case insensitive, but if you are looking for case sensitive matches, we have C match. That's probably no surprise to you. And there's negation too, let me come back and type that. So there's um, not match as well. So match then is going to require your regex expression, your regex proper that's a string, so it needs to be enclosed in single or double quotes. Again, power tip. Single quotes are for just straight expressions, straight string data. Double quotes are when you want to replace or expand, say, variables inside that quoted string. So in this case, a static regular expressions match would be something like this, region, where we would expect to get back those files. Now another thing, let me up arrow. Besides just a straight um, static match, we can start to introduce some basic regular expressions, what are called meta characters. And meta, as you probably know, comes from Greek. That means like above. Metadata is data about data. A meta character is where we use a keyboard character. In this case, I'll use the caret symbol. And it's not going to be interpreted by the regex engine slash dot net framework literally. Instead, it's going to take on special meaning because we're using match. The anchor character here, the caret, denotes the front of the line, or in this case, the front of the file. So this is going to make sure that anything I pick up here starts with region. If I have another file that's Texas region 3, I shouldn't get a match on that. All right. Let's see here. Let me clear the screen. 
I find that a lot of people aren't aware of um, the conceptual help in PowerShell, so I just want you to be aware that there's two good files that you should know about. One is about underscore comparison underscore operators, and I personally like the show window switch that's going to put that full help file in a separate window. And in my ISE, it takes forever to load the dadgum page. And yes, I've updated my help and all that other stuff. About comparison operators gives you your syntax, your conceptual help be behind the match and not match and so on. So I'm giving you that for your reference. The other about file that you should know about that's related is about underscore regular underscore expressions. There's actually a separate help file devoted to everything we're learning tonight, basically. All right, I'm going to control C out of that. This has been annoying me all day long. The fact that I'm running PowerShell v5 production preview, and I'm not sure if this is something that I should submit a bug report about or if it's just me. But anyway, note to self. All right, so besides match, another way just to do simple regex practice, or if you're you know kind of poking around developing your own regex expression, is that you can use static strings like any test string. It could be a number, a social security form, like take pizzazz, for instance. And you can throw just plain old text against the match comparison operator as well. And the match, again, is looking for a regular expression. Now, note that that evaluates Boolean to either true or false. You're probably thinking, well, yeah, that's cool, but did it match on this first ZZ? Did it match on the second ZZ? or did it match on both of them? Well, whenever you do a match, that value, the actual match itself, gets populated into an automatic variable called matches. Now, matches is a data collection and can theoretically store. As you see, it starts with index 0. It can store multiple match instances. But out of the box, the match comparison operator is not global. It will only give you the first match that the regex engine finds. I'm going to show some workarounds to that in just a moment. But if you found that in your experience and thought it was just you or that you were nuts, no, not at all. That, that is, unfortunately, the built-in behavior. I wish, again, maybe that's something else I could uh, mention to the PowerShell team. Let's see, besides doing those things, another approach, if you're comfortable with what are called type accelerators, there is a regex type accelerator. And this, I like to describe this as a more direct way to sort of go underneath PowerShell and more directly access the .NET Framework classes underneath it. And you can grab, I believe it's a method or a function called, meth called uh, matches. And this is going to be more powerful than just using a straight match comparison operator. And what you'll want to do, actually, let me come back and store that pizzazz as a variable. I'll just call it str. It's a good example because it's got the two sets of z's. And let me store the result in a variable as well. And we're going to say regex get us all the matches for the input string, and then the next thing you put in is your actual regular expression evaluation. And again, we're starting simple here, so as you see, that's just straight text. Uh, didn't like that for some reason. Let me see. Result equals regex matches. My syntax looks good. I'm not sure why that's blowing up offhand. Um, let's see. Unexpected token matches and expression. It's, uh, two colons you need. Thank you. Sure. Ah, I guess the squiggles could have told me something, right? All right. So now if we bring back result, you see it gives us a lot of data. It gives you the specific matches, the length, and the so on. So that was in result. And if we bring that over to get member, you can see the name of the methods or properties that you can grab from within there. So result dot, let's see, um, value, I guess would be good. 
and then I believe that uses an array syntax. So you'd start at zero, that should grab the first ZZ, and this, obviously this isn't a particularly interesting example because both matches are the same. But really what I'm just trying to show you is that it's possible to, to grab what you're looking for and kind of work around that match limitation, that non-global limitation. Let's see, marching on. Let me create another simple variable that has some spaces and a little another trick here to get all of the matches in that. In this case, let's see, what well, let's just say we want to separate or grab each of those instances of hello. We can grab the variable and throw that against another commandlet, select string. So besides using the regular expression comparison operators, namely match and it so on, a little bit later we'll look at replace and join and split. Besides those doohickeys, the other PowerShell element that involves regular expressions is select string, where you can analyze source text, it could come from a file or just a basic text variable like I have here, and look for a regular expression pattern. In fact, that's the um, parameter that we need in this case, if we're looking for a hello. There's a switch parameter that goes with select string. You'll want to make sure to include all matches if, in fact, you want to do a global find. And then here, you can just use dot notation to grab matches. And it's basically doing the same thing as that regex type accelerator example. But here, we're just staying directly within PowerShell, and we're using a little parentheses shortcut to be able to get to that matches data directly. All right. Let me switch on over from the ISE to another tool. Mike and I were talking a little bit about a company called Sapien Technologies. They have a product called Power Regex 2015, and that's what we're looking at right here. First of all, full disclosure, I'm not working for Sapien or any of the companies or websites that I mentioned to you tonight. So I'm not hawking product. I'm just simply sharing this to you because I think it's, it's useful. I don't remember what they charge, Sapien does, for the productivity pack. It's not just this tool. There's a whole bunch of them. But anyway, the upshot for us is PowerShell professionals. And the reason why it might be better than some web-based regex testers is it's got just handy commands where you can, in one click, export all of your matches into a file. It just can save you some extra coding. And then there's a whole educational element here because you get little quick access to the most common meta characters in regular expressions. OK, so as you see here, I have just a bunch of poorly formatted data that we can use to practice with as we start to get into some of these meta characters. Now, I keep mentioning meta characters. What are we talking about specifically? Well, let's just take a look over here. Um, we have in the first section, I know the text is probably small on your screen, so I'll just use this as we go along. But the anchors, particularly the caret that denotes the very front of a line, and the dollar sign that denotes the very end of a line, can be useful if you know that your matches are respectively at the front or the back. So let me see here. Let me just throw in a random IP address. Again, this is a very poorly formatted file, obviously. I intentionally did it that way. I'll repeat that IP address over there. And if we were looking for an IP address, how would we go about doing that? Well, number one, we already know that if it is going to be at the beginning of the line, we can start with a caret. And then we can start integrating some of these fun meta characters. The first one, you'll notice that most of them start with a, a backslash. D to denote a numeric character or a digit, 0 through 9. Power user tip number 566 <laughs> is when we're thinking of our regex matches, we work from left to right one character at a time, OK? It's slow and steady wins the race. At least that's my own personal take on this. So you'll notice that we see highlighted here the matches to that expression. And that's all well and good. It's matching the first digit. But you and I both know that an IP address can contain one, two, or three digits before the first decimal place. So how do we next evaluate that first, well, that first number? 
let me click off here. I don't want to mess with what regex is highlighting for us. Well, I'm just going to th throw us into the medium side of the pool here. You follow along with me, and, and any questions, anything you need for clarification, just hit me up. But what one way we can go is to use some of the iterators here. Another a way to do ranges with your matches are to use either parentheses, curly braces, or square brackets, depending upon what kind of match you're looking for. If you're looking for iteration, in other words, I want to see a decimal 0 through 9 one, two, or three times, you could just say in advance, I'm looking for three, cool. Or if you did that accidentally and hit two, you notice that's not good enough. Well, what if an IP address begins with 10 instead of 192? How are you going to match that? 10.10.10.1. Well, there, if we do three, it's going to totally skip over that entry, you see. So a nice trick with the curly braces is to specify your range like this. I'm looking for a digit one to three times. I don't think you can use a hyphen like you can with the square brackets. No, that ain't going to work, but you can do it like that. And I believe you can leave the front empty. No, I thought you could leave that empty, but no. Explicit is better than implicit, right? I guess that's what the Python coders say. So that's giving us, in this case here, the first octet. Now, you and I both know that we could also have an illegal IP address here. Right? We know that these octets need to go from 0 to 255, and on line 6 I have an invalid, but it's still getting picked up. So yet another tip along the way is that there's a basic regex, and then there's a more granular slash effective regex. And Adam Bertram, whom some of you might know, puts it in a funny way, I think. He says, I know I've got a good regex going when it's like super honk and long. <laughs> the longer and more complex and more gnarly the regular expression looks like, the better, right? So anyway, um, there's also many different ways to skin the proverbial cat. We could use other methods besides slash D. Just go with me right now, because we're kind of on this idea of basically matching a shape that looks like an IP address. Well, now you might think, well, dot and then backslash D. Oh, what, is it still picking it up? Yeah, it looks like it is. But is this dot really behaving the way that you want it to? Mm, that is debatable, because the dot is actually a wildcard character in regular expressions in the same way it is in the MS-DOS world. So. We have the ability to exclude or escape characters the same way we do in many programming and scripting languages. So common characters that you'll want to escape would be like the period, the decimal point. Um, UNC paths, if you're trying to match on a UNC path, the backslash itself we use to create our regex meta characters, so we would certainly need to escape that. Know that to escape is to just use a single backslash and then the character immediately afterwards will be taken um, literally instead of as a meta character. Okay, so we're saying decimal one three dot. We could just contrib just continue this party, couldn't we, with the same pattern one dash three, and then escape the dot again and backslash d one comma three. Hey, I made a rhyme. I'm going to have to share that with my five-year-old tomorrow. Escape the dot and then backslash d one comma three. So that's probably the most basic way to represent an IP address, but again, we know that that's not going to get us from point A to point B. It's not doing any validation as such. One advantage that tools like this one have and other regex tools, like regex body is another one that I use, is that you'll find that you can easily and quickly look up a little recipe. Like, let me see. Yeah, regex uh, pro or power regex, this is called. If I click IP address, it gives us what may be a better option, a more granular option. Let me copy that and paste that up above. What is this telling us? This is using a little shorthand. Um, the 
question mark colon borders on beyond our scope tonight because I don't want to cover too much. I know we don't have an awful lot of time together tonight. But the colon with the question mark says that we're not creating what are called capturing groups. What I've been showing you thus far as we match those IP addresses, we may be interested in just those matches to extract them out or whatnot. Um, you can use parentheses to group sections of a regular expression together if, for instance, you do want to capture just part of the expression. So it looks like Sapien is doing just that. They're saying explicitly we want just one match. We don't want to break it into groups. But you'll notice that they are using the parentheses. It's kind of a clever use of regex here because they're saying this whole bit here that's in parentheses is going to be repeated three times. And what is it that's being repeated three times? A zero through nine digit one to three times. So they basically compressed what we did by putting it together. And then finally they define the last octet over here. Come to think of it, that's not a particularly glorious match itself, is it? because it's not validating against valid or invalid numbers, like a number that goes above 255. Let me quickly pop open a browser. My favorite site for looking up, looking up regular expression recipes is regexlib.com. And all these links are in the notes that you can download afterwards if you're interested. But the way that I use, usually use this site is just put in what you're looking for here. Like maybe you're looking for instead of an IP address, you're looking for a social security number. And you should get one or more results back. I normally will tweak the rating to look at only the most highly rated ones. And you might need to tweak the category depending upon how many you get back. And in keeping with what Adam Bertram said, some of the really honk and long ones are going to take in edge cases, main cases, everything at the kitchen sink. You know that uh, social security numbers certainly have their own sets of rules in terms of numeric ranges. And it looks like this particular recipe is catching cases where you've got SSNs with or without delimiters and so on and so forth. So those are nice, but I want to help you go beyond just copying that out and using it and trying to make some more sense of it. So why don't we look at another case together. Let's say we need to match on all or part of a universal naming convention path. I'm using, by the way, this is my favorite tester. It's rubular.com. And the syntax that it uses is certainly close enough for horseshoes with the .NET framework that I've never run into any problems. And you can put in your own test string here. You could dump entire files in here if you want to. I'm pretty sure, although I'm not 100% sure, that this is all client-side code. So you shouldn't be exposing anything to the Rubular web server. But you know, better safe than sorry. I'd be careful about putting any production data in a web tester. But anyway, we can now go ahead creating any kind of match we want to. Like, let's say, for instance, we just wanted to match um, the server name here. Well, if we do a double backslash, it seems to catch things. Actually, it's um, catching all literal instances of the backslash. But you want to escape each one if you want to catch the two backslashes together that are part of the universal naming convention. Simp uh, syntax. Now, how about going beyond static um, text and starting to le leverage some more of these meta characters to get more accurate matches? Well, another class, what's called a character class, is backslash w. Some of them actually have reasonably um, intuitive names. You normally think of open source stuff as really cryptic and unintuitive, but w stands for word or a character. And you'll notice that just doing backslash w picks up one character. In order to iterate that, you could just do this, I guess, but that's not very economical. Remember, we want to think about performance and efficiency as well as accuracy. You could add plus to just keep iterating it. You see down here there's some little helper text here that the plus wildcard will pick up one or more occurrences of the previous character. 
So earlier I said that we want to look at our regular expressions from left to right. The other thing that we want to consider is that when we're using these meta characters and these classes and these symbols, they're normally going to operate on the previous character. So this plus says one or more characters. But notice that it stops matching at the backslash because the backslash isn't considered a word or an alphanumeric character. Now, um, I mentioned that in addition to using the curly braces to specify iteration, we also have things like the square brackets. The square brackets are excellent for substitutions and ranges. Like the classic example there is the one that I gave before, actually, where you've got realize and realize with a Z. Well, how could you match that? Well, we could try backslash W plus. That's going to catch everything. Um, until we get to either S or Z. And then I guess we might just throw on a static E for good measure, you see? Now, of course, you could do just a static match on R-E-A-L-I and then use your range to pick up S-C. Now, notice you don't need a comma or anything like that. The main character I'll use with these range captures is the hyphen. That should also pick up them both. Yes, it does. S through Z. I believe that this is case sensitive here in this engine. So if I do like capital S and capital Z, it's not matching. Because as you know, Windows is historically case insensitive, and Nix is just the opposite. Okay. So what are some other fun things we could do here? What if we just wanted to pick up the middle part, share? How could we cut that down? Well, we might say we're looking for a backslash S. No, that's not doing anything. How about escape the backslash share? Well, that's no fun. Um, how about S plus? Does that cut us there? No, because remember, plus is looking for one or more occurrences of the previous character. We could try S backslash W plus. But that's grabbing too much, isn't it? So you see that there's a lot of experimentation here in terms of how much static information you want to add versus how many meta characters. Let's come back to the ISC and clear the screen and see what other goodies I have on my little demo list over here. Yeah, this is an interesting example. I'm just going to copy it and paste it into the ISE. Another case with a universal naming convention. We're taking the UNC as the source input, and we're putting it against match. And notice that the expression is escaping the first two backslashes. It's looking for any word, any number of characters, until it hits the second backslash. And then we're looking for another word of any length. But notice that we've put this in parentheses. That's going to have a unique effect in PowerShell's regex engine. So um, I'm throwing that using the semicolon as a statement separator directly against the matches automatic variable. Let's see how that looks. So that gave us two entries back in our matches variable that we can address individually in our code. So for instance, if we just wanted the second capture group, the middle part of the URL, share three, this is a pretty elegant way to do it because we can do a, mag a matches on that index. Let me see, did it grab the correct one? No, OK, 0 and 1. 0 is the whole thing, and 1 is actually the share 0. So. Yeah, so that's exactly what I wanted, right, OK. Questions, comments, concerns? As an instructor, silence in the crowd can mean any number of different things. You can chat in the conversation window. You can speak audibly, whatever you think. No? Let me bring out some more code from my little cheat sheet. Let's say we're looking at a CSV file that happens to be in my directory. In fact, I will um, get its content. 
I guess I am using an alias in this case. And control C, just so you can get a flavor. This is a CSV file that contains several hundred rows of fictional user data. So there's a lot of worthwhile goodies in here. There's person, supposedly personal information like um, telephone numbers, and it looks like there's no SSNs. But it's good input, good uh, stuff to work on. A thing to keep in mind when you're um, applying PowerShell regex to a lot of source data, instead of just stat, you know, little strings that we've been playing with thus far, is that wherever possible, it's best to keep that data in an object form. Because as you know, in, in PowerShell, an object is a data construct that has a lot more going for it than just a plain old piece of static text. I like to describe objects as three-dimensional data structures. You know, you've got properties, you've got methods, and so on. So in this case, if we needed to isolate specific information inside this file, like let's say that we were tasked with finding all the customers whose zip codes began with 900. You'll see that a lot of them do, some don't. They're from all over the place. It's just dummy data I got from one of those sites online that you can generate. I think I got it from fakenamegenerator.com, as a matter of fact. But you'll notice that what I'm first doing is running an import CSV to bring that entire file into my run space here. And in order to get the data as faithful to source as possible, I'm using the backtick T to specify the tab delimiter. Let me run that particular line of code to bring it in. And if I do a dollar cust, you can see it gives us that data in a really nice, clean way. It's, it's object data, and it's all separated out and parsed for us. It's really beautiful. So now to search within that source data, this would be a good case for using the select string commandlet. And as you see in line 7, I'm taking that source, that CSV object, and I'm running it against a regex pattern. In this case, I'm looking for 900 and then any two digits that come after it. And I'm also specifying all matches on that. So let me select this line and run it. And again, we get a whole bunch of on-screen output. By default, the text is just going to standard out, right? But if we look inside that data, we see, sure enough, it is giving us what we need. So here's a trivia question for you. How would you then reconstitute a CSV file from this? I mean, how would you take all of these matches and maybe put them in a, another CSV file that you can share with your boss or the marketing person who asked for the data to begin with? What do you think? I see a couple people typing. That's a good sign. Yeah, I, I'm seeing export, convert CSV. It, all, it already is. I think it's formally a PS custom object data type, but it's essentially CSV. So if we redefine this as, say, result, result, if I can type, geez, we can then go result into export CSV path is um, result.csv, and then I'll do a notepad result. CSV, and then you've got your data, and so on, OK? So again, that's a simple example. I feel that, um, I hope I'm adding value for you here. Jeez. All right, so those are some matching. Um, let's take a look at replacements. I'll bring out some more code for us to look at here. If we're tasked with doing some data cleaning, how can we go about doing that? Again, keeping in mind that there's so many different ways to accomplish any goal. Mine may not be anywhere near as efficient as what you could come up with, for instance. Here on line 11, let's say we're going to grab the contents of this PII.txt file. And let's actually quickly take a look at the file. Um, PII.txt. It looks like it contains just uh, five names with five fictional social security numbers. So let's just bring that raw, unstructured data in using get content. And we packed it into a variable called in. And there you go. It's just exactly what I showed you a moment ago. One method for doing a replacement 
is to run that data into the pipeline using for each with the replace um, operator. Now, could you operate on the file itself? I've had mixed to negative results with that. My friend who, again, a person you might know in the PowerShell community, Jeff Hicks, reminded me that when a file is in use, you're not you're not going to really be able to replace the whole file. It can get tricky. So he suggested bringing the contents of the file wherever possible into your run space and do an operation on the objects directly. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to iterate through each of these rows using for each with replace where here is our first of all the regex expression comma and then whatever you're going to replace it with. So let's say in this fictional example we want to isolate personally identifiable SSNs and we're going to just redact it. We're going to do an out file to create a new version of the file called filtered PII.txt. But instead of having the sensitive data in the clear, we're just going to have it redacted like that. And to walk you through this regex pattern, it's got um, a new character that we haven't talked about yet. The B is, stands for boundary or word boundary. That's really useful when you're doing regex against delimited text or text that just has random tabs and spaces in it. Because when you bumper your regex expression with backslash B, it's looking, it wants, it, it basically is going to make sure that what you're catching is in isolation of anything else. Now you might run into problems if you had the data, in fact you would run into problems if for instance Carol Payoff had her SSN butting right up against the F. That's yet something else that you need to take into consideration. But if you know the data is isolated, the word boundary is a cool thing to add front and or back as sort of a bumper. And you'll notice that here we're looking for three zero to nine digits. We're escaping the hyphen and then just doing the same thing. Again, this is a simple catch that's not catching all of the fancy variations, but you've got online recipe sites to grab that code if you want to. So anyway, let's put our cursor <laughs> in that line, excuse me, run the code and open up that filtered.pii file in Notepad. All right, so I don't know if you can see that. Let me quickly boost the font. Okay, so there you have it. So now you've got a clean file that you can hand to your boss or whoever asked you for it. As far as splitting and joining while we're on the subject, just making sure that we're covering as much ground as possible, hopefully keeping things in some kind of context. Other things we can do on string data that you may already be familiar with are splits and joins. Well, we can do the same thing with regular expression data. I mean, it may not even involve regular expressions, as a matter of fact. Let's take a look at this example here. We have a variable that's picking up a UNC path. This actually could be the result of a match, <coughs> a match operation in a where object filter, or it could be the result of a select string extraction, whatever. But let's say you need to take or extract just part of that source string. There's the split operator for that. So in this simple case, we're just set defining a new variable that takes the source, which I'll load into memory, and it's going to split it at a particular delimiter or character. And what's beautiful about this is that this is, in fact, regex sensitive. So we can say, I want to split it at the backslash, and I'm going to use my regex escape to make sure that the regex en engine knows that I want to use the backslash as a literal, you see? So we'll run that split, and then echo back unc2, and that didn't give us what we wanted. Oh, simple syntax problem. The source is unc1. Let me run that again just to make sure I've got it in memory. And then we'll run line 20. And then I guess I'll just do this here. <laughs> and it shows us that we've successfully isolated each of those elements. They're not indexed, unfortunately, but at least they're separated at that point. You can reconstitute data that's split into parts using split's twin sibling, join. Or I guess it would be a cousin, right, if you want to use the proper metaphor. 
So I'm creating a third variable here that takes UNC2, our split data, and uses join, again, passing in, uh, in this case, just a literal how you want to reconstitute them. Let's see what this does, if this actually does what we want it to do. UNC3. That looks OK. All right, Arino. Let's see here. What else do we have? Um, as sort of a quick review, and then we'll wrap up with just some tying up some loose ends. I have an example here where I'm grabbing content from another text file. This is that really ugly hosts file that I showed you earlier in the Sapien tool. And again, since it's not a delimited file as such, we can just use get content to bring that into our session. And it looks like in this case, what we're going to do is run that content into select string, looking for it looks like a more robust expression. In fact, this is that expression that came from the Regex Pro, where it's using that shorthand, the parentheses, to take this pattern and duplicate it three times, and then create the final octet of the IP address. And remember that this little bit here just simply says that we don't want to create two groups here. We don't want a capturing group. We just want the whole match. All right, so that, that's, there's really, that's kind of anticlimactic, come to think about it. Let's see if there's any other need-to-know stuff down here in our list. We looked at ranges a little bit, the square brackets. We looked at the curly braces. Something else, I guess, is the colon. The colon syntax is going to look for a capture where everything enclosed is part. I don't, I don't really understand what that means. But certainly, this nomenclature here with the pipe is useful when you're doing what are called alternations. Like, let's see here. Let's say our sample string was, um, let's say, Mickey Mouse. Take a simple example here. And our capture expression, or our, our capture statement, might be Mickey, Pipe, or Mini, and then backslash word plus to catch the rest of it, you see? So you're able to construct as many of these as you want. And it works really nicely if you have a predefined collection of more than one um, character that you may want to match on. So something like this. So this should be able to match on Minnie Mouse, but it wouldn't match on Tom Mouse. And it will match on Tim Mouse, but will it match on Mickey underscore Mouse? No, it didn't, you see. So how would we pick that up? How could we capture that underscore? Any ideas? We want to put it right in between our alternation and before our word capture. Do you think a, um, an escape might work? No, it didn't like that. I wonder if a literal would work. Um, gee, I would have thought for sure that we could escape that as a literal. I don't know. Weird. Let's see, w's, digits, spaces. OK, right, there's a character class that picks up white spaces. That would be backslash s. So Mickey space space mouse. We might want to do, do a word match, backslash space. Maybe we know there's going to be anywhere from 0 to 5 spaces or 4 spaces. And then there's going to be some more characters. That's not going to pick up characters that have, actually, it would pick up 0 spaces. Let's change that to 1 space. And it shouldn't pick up matches that go beyond, although it, it does look like it's doing that. I'm just experimenting on the fly here, everybody. So any egg you see on my face is live without a net. So you know order of operations with parentheses. You can group together multiple statements to try to find a more granular match. All right, other resources that I have mentioned in the downloadable course notes as we round into the final stretch here. 
This is a site I would recommend from an educational standpoint, regular-expressions.info, especially the quick start and tutorials. If there's a downside to this particular site, though, is it's very verbose. So unless you're the kind of nerd who likes to read this stuff in bed with your iPad like I do, it might not be as rewarding. Um, and a fantastic site that I would suggest you make use of immediately is regx1.com. This is an interactive tutorial. Although it looks like it has a lot to it, it's like 16 lessons, you can buzz through it really, really quickly. The author covers a, a, a granular concept on each page. And check this out. You're asked to, in live code, match whatever task he or she is doing. And then these lesson notes. I find this is a really nice Cliff Notes area over on the right. It's a totally free site. Very, very useful. It's a half hour or so that I think will be well worth your time spent. All right, so what have we learned? Well, we've learned a lot of picky things, but from a more global standpoint, we know that there are several different ways to solve any regex problems. We want to keep in mind granularity. Ultimately, we want to keep in mind system performance. And we want to exclude any matches that we don't want to pick up. I hope you're a little bit more comfortable with the syntax of regular expressions than you were before. A tip I also want to leave you with is to avoid regex tunnel vision if you can. I know from personal experience you might be wanting or just convinced that you need to swing the heavy hammer with regex, but you may find a simpler result using just regular comparison operators in PowerShell. So always be open to that possibility as well. I've showed you all these websites, so you already know those. The tools I showed you, this one I didn't show you. This one costs, and it's kind of clunky, but it does a lot of the same things. It gives you a way to preview your code. It has a built-in library of predefined regex patterns and so forth. We've already looked at this. Books, you'll find that in the book market, O'Reilly has regular expressions pretty well covered up between these titles. The downside to these books, in my experience, is that they cover everything. In other words, you'll want to look specifically for the .NET framework to get um, help on PowerShell-related regex stuff. I'm writing. I'm going to start writing a book on the subject for SAMs, so be on the lookout for that in the next year or so. That's not a near priority, but I, I personally feel. I hope you agree that we PowerShell professionals could use a reference on using regex specifically in PowerShell scenarios. Specifically, some of the granular take-home messages that we looked at are those variety of comparison operators, match, replace, and we briefly looked at um, split and join, the string operators. We used select string a little bit to dive into a, a source file and look for one or all matches, and potentially for extraction and cleaning and so on. And I hope that you've picked up some new stuff along the lines of online regex testers like that. Rubular is pretty cool. And recipe sites and tools, tips and tricks. I promised you that I would give you the download link. Again, I haven't put the zip together yet. I should have that online in the next 15 minutes or so if you want to download that. And any questions, comments, concerns that you have going forward, um, feel free to contact me directly. Timothy Warner316 at gmail.com is my email. I didn't put up my Twitter handle, but it's Tech Trainer Tim. So definitely, let's keep this conversation going. I know we barely scratched the surface over the previous hour. So with that, I'm looking in the conversation window, Brian. I'm glad you like that regular expressions info. It's a dense site. But it's got it's got the information there, you know, if you're willing to dig just a little bit. With that, Mike, Ron, may I hand it back to you? Yeah, that was a great session, Tim. I appreciate you taking the time to present for I could our user try group. singing. If not, I've got my guitar <laughs> here. So yeah, really good presentation. Yeah, and if you write a book about the specific Anybody to power. Anybody want to hear also Mio? <laughs> if you, if you or Enter Sandman? Anybody a Metallica fan? But if I haven't already said so, thank you very much, everybody, for participating tonight. It really um, is always a joy 
to interact with fellow PowerShellers. And thanks again to you, Mike and Ron, for inviting me to present. Michael probably mentioned this, unless I'm inadvertently talking over him. I'm sorry if I am. But look on the MS p sug website on tuesday because the recording will be there and then it'll be posted to their youtube channel afterwards brian a fellow metallica fan i hear you man i hear you i've been with them since the beginning all right i will now stop presenting you're welcome david david lamb i miss being in a classroom with you I appreciate you being here because, I mean, you're beyond East Coast time, aren't you? You're at like 1030 at least where you are. And look, any questions? Brian, yes, I will um, type in my email contact address right now. Is it only 830, David? I for some reason pictured you east of Eastern Time. I, I really do. Um, I mean, I'm not going anywhere. If you have any questions, anything that you came in with tonight hoping to walk away with, and if you haven't, now's the time. Chat it in the dadgum window, and let's solve the issue right here and now, you know, because that, that's what this is all about, you getting uh, stuff that you can walk away with and use immediately. Would you be interested in doing a, a slightly more advanced one? Those online tester sites are fantastic just from a playing standpoint. I know being an IT pro as well as a trainer that it's one thing when you're putting out fires and you've got the heat on you, and it's another one when you're just able to take the time and play. I know that those are separate things. But that's really the way that you're going to get playful with regular expressions, is simply playing with it. And that Rubular, like I said, is a really fast, responsive online tester. You know, if you're concerned about using online testers, check out regexpal.com. That's an open source JavaScript library, and you can actually host that internally. You can host it on your own computer or in your intranet. And it's a pretty nicely functioning JavaScript-based regex tester. And that would allow you the convenience of a browser-based tester with the security that you're not inadvertently exposing any of your corporate data to a server somewhere. Debugx.com. Oh, neat. And sure enough, because .NET derives from the Perl compatible regular expressions or PCRE library, that would make sense that debugx.com would be good for PowerShell. Good tip, Brian. Let me make a note of that myself. Debugx.com. And just for completeness, I'm going to put that URL in the chat window because I'm no longer sharing my screen. It's always good to have a links list, isn't it? Shortcut list. And I put my demo script in there as well. So it's got a lot of more examples than I showed tonight for sure. So you might find some goodies in there as well. Okay, do we have any more questions? If you guys want to type them in or uh, or unmute and ask. All right, Arino. Well, if there's nothing else, I guess I'm going to hang up and go home to my family. Thank you all again for participation. I hope for your participation. I hope you have a fantastic night, and I look forward to chatting with you more in the future. Later. Thank you, Tim.